Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again for your patience whilst we were just getting set up here. Um, I'm, I want to express my gratitude uh, to those who have helped uh, make this Ethica tutorial possible, to Lorette um, and, and to Andre for his help uh, both here and in earlier preparation in um, uh, making, uh, uh, making it uh, such a, an easy thing to get started here. Um, so, uh, within this tutorial, I'm going to provide a systematic introduction to a quite sophisticated system known as um, the Ethica Health uh, Data Collection System. I'm going to be providing a, an introduction that includes very hands-on components, as well as a systematic walkthrough of the functionality of, of this um, multi-platform um, uh, system that that uh, Ethica provides with an eye towards enabling most um, uh, basic use of that system. Coming out of this tutorial, you should have at a very practical level familiarity with setting up studies using Ethica tool, with configuring those studies to, uh, to establish different types of surveys, um, to configure so that it collects data from multiple data sources, to learn how to deploy those studies, to learn how to monitor data coming in from those studies, to refine them further, and at a basic level, we'll talk about some basics of analyzing that data, okay? Um, now, this tutorial will include hands-on components. It will also include um, some uh, systematically structured presentations in the form of slides. I will make those slides and the recordings available to anyone. So don't feel like you've got to scribble down notes. All this uh, will be available to you um, in, uh, in coming days and weeks, and I'll, I'll be providing a link uh, for that. Um, to that end, I would ask if people could leave um, contact information so that I could, I could send you the appropriate link, uh, I'd be grateful, okay? Um, so I wanna provide uh, just a couple of early comments um, uh, about uh, uh, what Ethica is, um, uh, 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 an overview of, of what it provides, but then I wanna jump in to some hands-on components so that everyone can quickly orient themselves the basic gist of what Ethica provides. And it's, it's actually quite easy to show, but hard to describe. And so I thought by doing that early, number one, if anyone has to leave early, I know Lorette does, maybe others, you'll carry away actually a pretty good orientation as to basically what Ethica is and how it works. Um, for those who want to stay longer, it will also provide a point of reference as I start going through some of the conceptual material. So if I start talking about variable substitution or conditional questions, or if I start talking about issues having to do with wearables, you can situate it based on an actual study you saw us create, okay? Um, it will also provide you direct familiarity, if you so wish, with the uh, smartphone-based um, uh, version of, of, of Ethica, okay? So what I'm going to do to this end is uh, provide a screen sharing here um, to uh, my uh, to my screen so that I can I can show some slides. Okay, um, and these slides will uh, provide you with um, a little bit of an overview of the system before I jump into um, uh, some of the hands-on components in, in the coming minutes. So. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, those online can um, see this, uh, see these slides, but I'm going to start a presentation here. Um, Andre, I don't know if there's any way that you could know what people online are, are seeing, um, but if... Okay, good. So um, I'm hoping the, um, the uh, audio uh, feedback won't be uh, too big a barrier here. So um, Ethica is a system that whose uh, development really started in 2008. Notably, and per its name, um, not uh, from in terms of the um, 
uh, of its technical development yet, but actually in consultations with our multiple ethics boards at University of Saskatchewan. We actually started this whole project with a look at the ethics of collecting data with smartphones and wearables to situate us for not just what was technically possible, but what was um, rigorous from, a, from an ethical uh, standpoint. Um, I'm noticing that panel up there, and I don't see yeah. it on my screen. That's no, an interesting thing. Yeah, that's that's what they are seeing. And okay. Perhaps if you can take the audio out. Okay. Your, okay. Um, okay. This is. Um, so turn off the audio. The audio. Yeah. Okay. Um, getting feedback. There is a feedback. As I call. Okay. Is it possible to just um, pause the um, the playing of audio on another machine? I ask in part because I'm also part recording it locally, just in case. It's, it's just the output. Uh, you okay. Can keep the microphone. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll suppress so, the output. Pardon me, folks, as we just... Um, uh, so I'm going to go and suppress the output uh, on my machine here, and we will mute that. Okay? And um, I trust that people are still hearing uh, my voice. Um, so, uh, yes, yes, yeah. here. Okay, great. So Ethica started in 2008, and it's, uh, it came out of a project called the IEPI project, which, of which Ethica was the third generation of systems created, successive generations which led to successive refinements of our need. The goal here, from the get-go, was to create uh, a widely accessible, and by accessible I mean easily used by a wide variety of health scientists without needing to get computer scientists such as myself involved. System that, that was flexible and scalable for collecting and analyzing data from smartphones to wearables for human behavior research with a particular focus on health behaviors. Um, I include health behaviors, also aspects of health exposures, exposures to environment, social environment, built environment, um, uh, food environment, et cetera. And um, IEPI, in its early incarnations, enjoyed really rapid uptakes among many of our colleagues and in research studies, which brought in additional funding. Um, increasingly, we were being asked to provide, um, what, in addition to the research side of, of, of uh, Ethica use, we were being asked to provide large-scale service delivery with Ethica for studies running from 10,000 to 100,000 people enrolled in it. This was a tall order for graduate students in my lab um, who are not in the habit of running call centers for you know, people to call in with, with the issues with their phone models or what have you. And with support by our university, we actually spun off Ethica as a company from our lab with the idea being that Ethica as a company would handle the two components that we felt were best handled in the private sector, two wet service delivery and software development according to software development best practices. I teach software development, that's part of my skill set, but um, in terms of hiring highly experienced software developers, you tend not to find that amongst graduate students, you find that among people who've worked in the software industry for many years and have an understanding of best practices. So we spun off Ethic as a company to handle those sides our lab is still highly involved in the research arm, analyzing that data when it comes to more sophisticated types of data, particularly like sensor data and, and data from, um, uh, from complex study designs. So Ethica itself, putting aside the predecessors, for, which have been used for dozens of studies themselves, Ethica has been used in about 87 studies worldwide with about 8,000 participants. Um, it's been used by about 30 institutions across eight countries. We've gone through dozens of, of research ethics boards for applications of Ethica. And it's been used by a wide variety of, of prominent organizations, including um, large universities like Stanford, Harvard, Columbia University, University of Michigan, et cetera. Um, but also um, by, by provincial agencies such as Alberta Health Services here in, in Canada. It is available on nine languages. When I say available in, what I mean is its menus, its environment can be provided in, in uh, many languages, left to right languages, right to left, um, et cetera. It, it can be adapted to show content 
um, surveys and buttons and so on, and a much wider variety of languages yet. But these are the ones for which the whole system is available, and that's an expanding, expanding set. We have uh, uses now in Bengali, for example, and we'll be rolling out a Bengali version of, of Ethica as a whole later. So what is Ethica? At, at the base of it, Ethica is multi-platform software. Notice I say multi-platform. It involves smartphones, wearables, and, and web, which allows researchers to collect and analyze data on human behavior, attitudes, beliefs, exposures, using the web, smartphone, and, and wearable technologies. Okay. Um, uh, the web is a side of Ethica that's rapidly developing. There's a, um, a rollout that's going to occur sometime this summer with very high likelihood for a complete web-based version of Ethica. Right now, for data collection, the emphasis is on smartphones and wearables, but the, we anticipate the web version within a couple months. And the basic gist of this, again, You'll get the gist from showing you walking through a study, and we'll do that quickly. But the basic overall picture here is we have uh, people who administer studies, which we'll use the term researcher, recognizing that this may involve frontline health personnel as well. It may not be strictly researchers only, who access what's called the research dashboard. And they create studies. They define studies. They configure studies, meaning they specify studies through a graphical user interface that doesn't require programming so much as careful specification of the characteristics of that study. What data sources you wish to use, the survey instruments and the triggering conditions for those surveys, the conditions under which those surveys are launched, actualized, whether it's button pushes by the participant or timings or the detection of a nearby person of a certain type, et cetera. And then there's a set of extensions. Um, a participant within an Ethica study can then interact with different platforms. And again, the web-based data collection platform is most of the way developed, um, but um, still has to be fully rolled out. Some past studies have sought to engage participants in other web-based uh, interactions, including websites, and to see their data. So I'm going to be providing a brief look at Ethica, and I'd like to get people involved. It's purely optional. If, if, if you'd like to download Ethica to this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through getting, seeing what Ethica looks like by getting it on a phone, um, joining a study, who, which we're going to define in front of you, and, and you'll see what the interface is like. You'll see how you can interact with it. And then... At the end of the session, you can uninstall Ethica if you'd like, or you could quit the study if you'd like. Um, but uh, it'll give you an experience that um, uh, really enhances your understanding of what Ethica is about. If you don't want to do that, that's great. Um, feel free to, to look, look over someone's shoulder. Okay. So um, for those who have smartphones, I would like you to go to the appropriate app distribution mechanism for your smartphone. So if you have an Apple smartphone, go to the Apple Store. If you have a, um, a smartphone that's Android-based, go to the Play Store, which is indicated, as you probably know, by that little sort of um, uh, triangle with the, with the right arrow. Okay. Now, once you're at the Apple Store or the Play Store, I would like you to go to the little search box there for what to search for, and I'd like you to type in Ethica, that's with a C, E-T-H-I-C-A, health, okay? That's a step, separate word. So Ethica health, okay? And if you search in this way, you should see a set of responses. Um, of relevance. One of them will show a puzzle piece. It looks like a little puzzle piece. It's in blue um, that, that says Ethica from Ethica Data. And that's actually the one you want. Okay, It is free. Downloading the Ethica app for people in general is free. And I would ask that you click on that and open and install it Okay, on your phone. Again, you, you can get rid of this at the end of the, the session. I'll show you how you can leave the study at the end of the session as well. Okay. 
Ethica by itself, downloading it, does not collect your information. Okay? Um, Ethica only will collect information when you join the study. And that's what I'm going to be walking you through. So if you could get Ethica on your system, um, variously, you click on it, and there'll be a button for you that says install, and you'll need to install it. Okay? Now, once you install it, I know it'll take a bit of time to download, so I'm trying to give a bit of time here. But once you install it, you should open it, and it will come up. And it's going to ask you something that it only needs on a one-time basis. Okay? And that is your username, I'm uh, sorry, an email address and a password you want to use to log into Ethica from now on. If you want, you could use a fake email address if you don't want to, if you don't want to provide that. In order to see this, though, when you come to Ethica, it'll ask you, do you have an account now, or do you need to sign up? It'll say sign in or sign up, and you need to choose sign up, okay, to, in order to, um, uh, to, create, um, to create an account with the, with the phone. You will need to be online for this to, to download the app. Ethica runs offline. You can use Ethica when you're out on a canoe trip or when you're up at a farm and, and offline. That's fine. You can use it for weeks. But for now, to, to get started in a study, you need to be online and to, to download the app. You need to be online. Okay? So I'm going to give people a bit of time to do this, to get it on their system. And again, you can enter a fake username, a fake first name, last name, email address if you want. Um, you, you don't need to rely on it. It's If you forget your password, Ethica could remind you if it's a real address. But if you don't want to, you want to give a fake, fake name, so that's fine. It, it doesn't rely on that being correct. Okay? Some of the studies we use. We ask participants to use their real e email address so we can reach out and contact them. Some of them, we, we give it email addresses that we maintain so that we get messages that can help, so that we can help manage their phones. For example, the study we brought with homeless individuals in Regina where um, we helped walk them through reset, resetting the phone login, et cetera. Okay. So I'm giving you a bit of time. Has anyone gotten Ethica on their phone already? Okay. Um, have people, has anyone yet entered uh, information so that you could um, sign, uh, sign on to Ethica? So in other words, sign in, okay. Others, who would like a bit more time here? A bit more time, okay. Okay, so we're going through this process as if we are a participant. Now, in a few minutes, I'm actually going to ask you to, to interface as a researcher so you can actually see the researcher side of Africa, okay? Now, for that, we're actually going to use a different email address, okay? So, Ethica, if you're interacting as a participant on the one hand and a researcher on the other, you should do so with different email addresses so that the two aren't mixed up, okay? And and uh, there's privacy issues with this, et cetera. So, so as a researcher, you're going to want to remember what email address you used as a participant and use a different one for the researcher, okay? So just, just try to remember which one you use for the participant and which one you use for the researcher. Keep them separate, because Ethica will use both in different contexts, okay? So anyone want a bit more time? Glad to provide it. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go through, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, when you get, get this on your phone there, we're going to go through creating a new study. And I'm going to start that process right now. Okay? You're welcome to focus on getting Ethica signed in and so on. Uh, if anyone needs help, please just raise your hand. I'm happy to walk you through it. Okay? But I'm going to start creating a new study. And to do this, what I'm going to need to do is to go and uh, log in to the Ethica site in what's known as the dashboard, okay? Um, what this is, is, oops, that's not my, that's not my bag. Um, here we go. Um, the dashboard is, is what I call this, um, this thing up here, the researcher dashboard. So to get to the researcher dashboard, I go to www.ethica.com slash dashboard, okay? 
and that's going to bring me to a um, to a site where I'm interacting as a researcher. Okay, um, so I have just just gone to Ethica and logged in actually as a researcher here, and um, yeah, it's remembering me from past sessions, so it didn't ask for my username and password that time. But what you're seeing here is the interface to Ethica from a researcher perspective. What you're going to see right now is the, re the participant interface, right? And later you'll come here. Won't be long, maybe another half hour, we'll be here together, okay? Okay, so within, this, um, within the context of this dashboard, you'll see that there's a set of options. And we're going to walk through this a lot in the coming two, hour, two and a half hours. But one of the things is this thing that says create study. Do you see that? Um, I know it's a little bit uh, blurry back there, and I apologize. Um, but there's, a, there's an item up here that says create study. So I'm going to create a study. You'll notice I have, I have access to a lot of different studies. Um, we, we run a lot of studies. I'm going to create a new study here. Okay, And as I create a study, I'm going to define that study's characteristics. Okay, I'm going to, to specify the characteristics of the study that I want to create. Okay, um, So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to name this study. I'm going to say uh, McGill um, Ethica Demo uh, 5 2009. And Normally, when we define a study, if this were a real study, we would typically have a consent form which informs individuals about this study, what data is being collected, the expectations of them, um, their access to the data that is created, whether they can delete their data if they later decide they want to do so, how they can pause the data collection, all sorts of things. For now, um, to, to make this quick, I am going to simply, ins um, you know, th I'm going to insert some placeholder text. This is uh, a placeholder for the uh, consent form. Um, um, uh, you will be able to see this on the uh, phone uh, once um, you are considering joining the study. Okay, so I'm just providing a bit of information. So what am I doing? I am configuring a new study in a way that specifies its character and that you'll be seeing this study in just a few minutes on your phone. Okay? And you'll have the option to join. Um, and if you uh, elect to join, um, you'll, you'll take part with the characteristics I specify. So I'm going to say next. Now for the enrollment, it's asking, okay, look, um, uh, what's the study period of operation? What's the date it starts? I'm putting that as today. What's the date it ends? I'll put it as a week. I'll put it as a month from today. Okay, we'll just say a, a month from today. Um, so instead of May, we'll do it as um, June, uh, June 16th. Okay? Um, I can make it open-ended alternatively. Then there's a question, how long does each participant um, stay in the study? Um, I'll say it's the same as the study here, but often we have a cohort that we're recruiting over time. Each person might be in the study for seven days, but the entire study might run a year because we have rolling enrollment. And that's where these two might not coincide, right? Um, target sample size, well, heck, maybe you want to invite your friends. Uh, I'll say uh, 50 people, okay? Um, and then it asked me, is this public, um, anyone with the registration link can join it. Is it invitation based that it's only invited individuals um, or is it a closed study just for kind of our experimentation? I'll say it's open, okay. So anyone with the link can join. Um, and then I'll say, I, and now I specify what's data sources, okay. Ethica is configured to collect information that involves people's self-reported answers, but also critically data from wearables, smartphones, sensor devices. And when I use sensor, I use that in a broad sense. I'm using it to include things like GPS location. I'm using it to include aspects of whether they're near a beacon, which might signal you know, a, um, a child and mother being nearby, or maybe it's a, a nearby service dog, 
or maybe it's that I'm near the pill cart in a long-term care facility, okay? Um, maybe to a resource. Uh, it also includes things like the screen state of the phone. Like, is the phone uh, screen on or is it off? Um, uh, what level of physical activity I've been on? Have I been gotten? All of those are on the phone. I can also have data from wearables, as we'll say, okay? So, um, so I'm going to set up a set of um, data sources, and um, uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, make it fairly simple. I'm going to set up a GPS, and I'm going to say it's mandatory. Someone who, who doesn't have GPS enabled won't be able to join this, uh, join this study, okay? Um, I'm going to add another data source. I'm going to say step counts, okay? So this would be under... Um, down here, uh, and it'll be the pedometer data source. So I'm adding these in. Notice that I'm doing this on a per-study basis. Ethica for different studies, well, very different, it, different data sources associated with it. One Ethica study might only collect um, survey data. Others might collect a whole battery of things, accelerometer, screen state, you know, uh, um, aspects of social context from beacons, et cetera. Okay, um, uh, so each study is, uh, data is, has study-specific needs. I'm going to set up surveys here, okay? Um, survey responses, those are typically part of every study I, I can think of. We ask people some self-report information, even if it's only a time of study entry. Um, and... Um, I would note that we could also set up uh, a variety of wearables additional, such as like Google Fit, calories, and pedometers. Um, we could also do things like, um, like people's app use or screen state, although we won't do it here. Okay? Um, so here's a set of, of um, others. I would note that further, um, I'm not going to cover it here. But um, outside of this list right now are some additional data sources that require what are called Ethica plugins. Do you remember when I searched on, on the store, I saw a bunch of things come up? That's because some of them are extensions to Ethica. So for example, there's an extension we've run with Harvard School of Public Health that involves monitoring browsing behavior for people. Okay, so it actually keeps track of what sites they're going to with different browsers on their phone. And that um, is a plugin. It's not a core Ethica functionality. Uh, we don't want to have to ask everyone who installs Ethica for whether it's okay for browser monitoring. We, we instead will, um, will not even enable it on a study-by-study -study basis. It requires a plugin. Okay, so I've just added these, um, these data sources. Those can be changed later. You can come back and change this, but it's useful to specify them up front. Next, for study configuration, I'm going to configure a few things here, okay? Um, I'm going to say, um, do I enable dropout through the app? Yes. People can drop out of this study at any time through the app. Um, I will not enforce the data only be uh, uploaded via Wi-Fi. People should be able to use their cell data connection if they have one. Um, some studies, particularly for lower income people, we might want to say we only upload data Wi-Fi because we don't want to impose any risk of that we're, we're um, going to you know, cost them money for overage charges on their data plan. Okay. Um, um, we can also specify a study background. This is a picture. Um, I'm not going to do that here. And then it's saying, look, um, do we send reminders to people if they haven't uploaded data recently? I'm going to skip that for now, but just be aware that Ethica um, can send out reminders to people for that and other aspects of adherence. Okay? So I've just said okay, and I said create study. And it says it created it successfully. Do I want to define the surveys right now? And I'm going to say yes, okay? Because this is kind of the other typical part of what you do when setting a study up first. You not only specify data sources, um, more generally, including surveys, you, you define surveys, okay? You define a few sur surveys up front, and then I'll invite you in, okay? So uh, bear with me for, for just a sec. I'm going to go add a new survey here, okay? So... 
When we go add surveys, and I'll show you how you can get to this through the, through the dashboard in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but uh, probably about half an hour from now. I'm going to set up a survey. It's going to be called a um, baseline survey. Okay. This is going to be a survey of study entry. At time of study entry, people will be asked this survey. And then we're going to set up some other ones that are like when people push a button or it pops up at a certain time. Okay. Um, so for the survey, um, for the survey name, we've specified that. Um, survey type, we have a choice of uh, eligibility, baseline, generic, or, or um, an exit survey. And I'm going to say a baseline survey, okay? Um, and uh, we are going to, based on that, um, be able to skip these questions about triggering because it's very clear when it triggers. And here I am going to set up the questions that are asked, okay? So I'm going to establish some questions in this baseline survey. So in this baseline survey, I've just said create a page of the survey, okay? And now I have on the left-hand side here a palette of options. By palette, I mean I'm gonna be able to drag these over and create a survey out of these question types. Ethica surveys contain a, a sophisticated set of functionality. Um, a few of the items are, it can support multimedia questions, things like um, photos, video, audio um, responses. It can also include pictures and, and videos to show people when they're answering the surveys too. Think about people who might be less literate and, a, and an icon might be quite useful. In addition to that, you can have um, instruments that allow people to have preferences, like for metric or imperial measurement systems, for example. So weight and height, they can choose their unit systems. Um, it includes uh, the capacity to have choices as to how to answer with audio or freeform text. We'll come back to this in detail in the, over in the systematic walkthrough. But for right now, I'm just going to drag a few things, okay? I'm going to show you a, a few items here with an eye to getting you on this as soon as possible. So I'm going to ask about age. Now, age, um, someone's age. So in order to do that, I'm going to use a number uh, survey type or survey question type. So um, here, I just dragged it in from here to here, and I'm going to say, please enter your age in years, okay? Um, and uh, this is a number um, type because they'll select, you know, um, you know, 20 years, 30 years, or what have you, okay? Um, we can s select um, what's the granularity of the numbers, uh, here it's just granularity of, of one, so one, two, three, et cetera. And we can set maximum and minima if we want to. I'm going to skip that for now, okay? Um, next, I'm going to ask them to enter their height and weight, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll drag in length, and I'll say, please uh, enter your height, okay? I don't need to specify units because it will allow them to do so. Um, and similarly for weight, uh, he's dragging a mass. So please enter your weight, okay? Um, now notice for each of these though, I can specify a default. So here the default is centimeters, okay? Um, uh, I could change that to inches, you know, feet and inches if I want to. Um, and, but they can still choose on their own, which one they prefer. This is just the default, okay? So I'll change it to feet and inches, let's say, and I'll change um, weight to pounds by default, okay? I'm gonna say save here, okay? Um, and we've now defined, um, defined this study, um, and I'm going to do what's called publish it, okay? And I'm gonna say publish the study. Now, no one here is yet enrolled. If you are enrolled, you'd be getting the new version of the survey, but that will come in just a few minutes, okay? Next, I'm going to go back and I'm going to define another survey. Mm -hmm. This survey will be different. That one was a baseline. It's asked at one time point, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the study. And if I go and were to look here, um, uh, 
what you'll find is that uh, with surveys here, um, uh, a, a baseline survey is at this, at, at this point uh, shown as participant joins, okay? That will be when that question is asked. Now we're going to ask some surveys that are asked over time uh, based on varying triggering conditions, okay? So to do this, I'm going to go back to my interface here, and I'm going to add a new survey. And I'm going to imagine that this, this is a, uh, st a study that perhaps is in, uh, investigating tick-borne illness. Okay? So I'm going to have a survey that is um, going to be, for a participant, reporting a tick. So it's going to be report uh, tick or found, maybe I'll say uh, found tick. Okay? They, they found a tick. And we're going to ask them to take a photo of the tick and um, answer some questions about personal protective behavior in which they were engaged. So I'm going to have a, a found tick uh, survey. Um, and uh, this is going to be a generic survey type. It's not going to be a baseline. It's not an eligibility question. We're not asking, are they eligible to be part of the study, which is yet another type. It's a generic one. Um, but it's a special type of generic one. So we're going to say generic, and we're going to further indicate here that it's a user-triggered survey. And what this will mean is there's a button for it. There's a button that will allow them to trigger this survey. And the button will be, you know, um, uh, I found uh, a tick, okay, um, uh, on myself, okay? Okay. Um, and so this will allow them to report that, which, amongst other things, by taking a photo of it, we'll be able to know what type of tick it is. We'll know uh, from their GPS where they were previously, and we'll know something about um, the personal protective behavior that they were engaged in uh, when, when, um, when, when they might have gotten that tick on them. So I'm going to add a page now to the survey. And uh, we will now go through and ask some questions, okay? Um, so the first type is going to be a, a multiple answer type of question. This is a type of question that allows uh, not just one answer, but multiple answers. So it's, it's with checkboxes. Confusingly, right now, it's called multiple choice. Uh, personally, I think that's a bad name for it, and I'm working on our developers to change that. But the basic gist is this will have multiple checkboxes, and they'll be able to indicate, you know, which of set of choices they they have. Um, in this case, personal protectors they've engaged in. So I'll ask about. Uh, please indicate the personal protective behaviors in which um, uh, th that you have been practicing in the last day. Probably not the best wording, but um, bear with me. Um, and I'll add a question. So wearing long sleeves, um, uh, and I'll add another answer. Wearing, uh, wearing long, oh, wearing long pants, um, and uh, pulling socks up over the bottom of my pants um, and uh, wearing a hat uh, and avoiding contact with, um, uh, with vegetation um, and uh, vegetation and high grasses. Okay? Um, so we've just defined a question. It's a multiple answer question. Um, next, we're going to define a different sort of question, a single choice question. This is going to ask them, could you take a photo of the tick that you found? Question mark. Okay? And they can either answer yes or no. Okay? Notice for each of these questions there's a set of options to the right, which I'm not covering. I'll come back to those later for many of those will be referred to in my more systematic coverage later. Um, so yes and no. So perhaps they removed the tick and they threw it out. Um, they got rid of it before they could show it. Um, 
Okay, next, um, we are going to, on the basis of that, ask them to take a photo or not. If they say no, they can't take a photo, we're not going to ask them, right? So in order to capture this functionality, there's actually several ways to do it in Ethica, but one of them is to add a new page, and I'll add a page below. And we'll make this page, the, its appearance, contingent upon the answer to this question. So if they say, no, I want to take a photo, or I can't take a photo, we won't ask them this page. We won't show it to them, okay? It's a conditional page. It's a skip pattern implied. So here, for this page, what do you think I'll drag in? Well, it's an image question. In other words, it will allow them to submit an image. Most of the time it will be from the camera, but they can choose a pre-existing photo if they want to. Okay? So this will be... Um, Please uh, take uh, a photo of the tick um, from approximately 10 centimeters uh, away, um, uh, being, being sure to show the top of the tick's uh, body. Okay, um, So maybe we want to give a bit of guidance. And this will allow them to take a photo or share a photo. Okay, But... There's something I haven't done yet. What haven't I done? Anyone? Remember, I, the reason I set up this page was what? Yeah. You, you haven't like, made it contingent. I haven't made it contingent. I haven't made it conditional on that previous question. So in order to do so, we're going to go to the, we're going to select this page as a whole. Here we go. And there's a criteria here, okay? And this is the criteria for this page to be shown, okay? Um, and uh, we are going to basically set criteria which will, um, which will only enable it based on the answer to the previous question, okay? Um, and uh, here, um, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to put in a uh, criteria. So it's going to say if question two had an answer of one, okay, um, here. So in other words, if they gave the first answer to question two, and notice I use double equals. Those of you who might be familiar with, with uh, programming languages might recognize this is a convention for a variety of programming languages. You say double equals when it mean I'm testing is it is it one in this case, okay? So I'm going to say uh, save here, okay? Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to say validate. And that will test, hey, does it understand my survey? Or is it, for example, confused about that expression, okay? It understands it in this case, so I am a, a happy camper, okay? So I said validate, and now I'm going to do this publish okay and I'm going to say publish this and it's now a, a published uh, survey so now I have two surveys okay but there's something else I want to do and I actually should have been more careful in doing it the first time around I'll show you how you can um, select that survey here I'm gonna say edit it here and I forgot to do one thing when I was filling it out so here's the survey I just defined. It's, it's uh, user triggered by that button. And I want to so capture location. When they use that, I want to know where they were when they filled that out. I want to know where they found that tick. Um, were they at home? Were they in, still in you know wilderness area? Were they in a park? What, what have you? When they reported it. I know where they've been through GPS, but um, and I could cross-reference GPS and find out where they are now, but it's easy often if you just stamp the survey with where it is. It makes it easier to reason about where it you know, was actually submitted. Um, and by the way, you can do this even if you don't enable GPS. So if all you want is GPS stamps for your surveys, you don't have to enable GPS as a data source. Just geotag your survey. Okay. So I'm going to say uh, save here, okay? Um, and um, that's, that's great. I'm just going to do one more thing here, which is going to set this up for you to, 
to download it in a more complete experience, okay? So what I'm going to do is add one more survey, and I apologize for, for keeping you waiting here, but I want to add one more survey. This one is going to be um, uh, an EMA one, Ecological Momentary Assessment one, meaning it's an experience sampling. Here it's going to be triggered at a certain time to elicit information, okay? Um, and it's, it's abbreviated EMA. It's a generic survey. It's not user-triggered. Instead, it will be triggered via a schedule, um, and I'm going to specify the schedule now. So it's going to be, uh, be triggered on an ongoing basis, okay? So it's going to say repeatedly trigger it. Um, it will uh, be triggered here um, uh, on the first day of a participant's um, participation in the study. So it says, note that the trigger time is relative to midnight if the participant's enrollment date, okay? Um, and it'll actually tell you when it's going to be triggered, okay? Um, and it's telling me, okay, based on that. So I'm going to actually say uh, day zero here, okay? Um, uh, so assuming they're joining at this time, notice I didn't change my time zone, sorry. I, I should have been more careful about this. Um, I'm going to, uh, to, to repeatedly trigger it. It will be, uh, let's say, uh, daily, okay? Um, repeat uh, every day and uh, will never end the repetition. And it will be between these times of day. I'll say 9 a.m. to, let's suppose I say um, uh, 8.30 p.m., okay? Um, and it'll be drawn from a uniform time here, okay? Um, and I'm going to say confirm. Notice it will tell me when it's expected to be triggered. These are example times. And this lets me sort of test my understanding of the rules, right? Like when is it likely to be triggered based on my, on my definition of the rules, okay? And I think I'll move the earlier time to start at 7 a.m. I'm just going to ask it during the day uh, between these times, and it will be repeated and on a daily basis um, and so on. And I will say confirm here, okay? Um, and there we go. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now we have uh, defined uh, the surveys. So I just published that last one. Um, if you would like to, um, to go and uh, uh, get involved with the participant side, I will tell you how to do so, okay? So if you'd like to go to your phone, um, you can go find Ethica on your phone. So if, you're, if you have a phone, you can you know, go through the phone screens until you see that little puzzle piece. It's a blue puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. It should be an icon if you installed it on your phone as an app. If you click that puzzle piece, maybe you're already in it because you logged in. If you haven't logged in yet, if you haven't signed up yet, you'll have to enter that information, fake or otherwise. But once you're in it, once you're in this, if you use this menu, there should be a menu in the upper left. On my phone, it looks like a little set of bars going in parallel. I'm going to pull down that menu, and I'm going to select Join Study. It's a, there's a plus next to it. Do you see that? Now, this is actually not the most common means. The most common means is you just provide a link to the participant. I don't know your folks' email addresses, otherwise I could send it to you or post it on our website. Absent that, we're just doing it this manual way. So, um, so again, through the menu, there's a plus that says join study. Do you see that? And I'm going to give you a study ID number. And I'm actually going to find that out right here. It's 741. Okay, 741. And I'm going to say find. And it shows me, I don't know if you folks are seeing it, 741, do you see that McGill demo? Uh -huh. And you'll notice, wh where's that text coming from? Anyone recognize that? There's a bit of text here underneath the little icons. Oh, why did it say University of Saskatchewan? Terrible. I should have said McGill. Sorry. Sorry, um, I betray my roots. Um, uh, but you see this is placeholder text for a consent form? Do you remember where that came from? That was, I entered that right in front of you, right? 
And then, you know, below it says information like it has location and, you know, GPS data and pedometer and survey responses. And then I'm going to say register. On my lower right, it's going to say register. So normally this would be a consent form. Um, often we do video consent as well or, or in-person meetings sometimes. But when I say register, something happens. Can anyone tell me what happens? Baseline. Yeah, you get a baseline survey, right? And you can enter your age and years. Notice I didn't specify a limit. So I know there may be some characters here that may want to, you know, say they're 100 years old or something. And I'm not going to get in the way of it. I'm going to enter my real age. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to enter my white, the height, my height. Do you notice with height you can choose your units? I don't know if you can see that. But... Um, you know, I'll specify it in the units of my choosing. Um, and you notice that right now feet and inches is selected as the default because that was the default I specified, right? And then weight accordingly, I'll specify my, my weight here, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll specify, I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. Um, uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, having done that, I'm sorry? There's no default validation on this one. So uh, the validation is supported if you enter those maximum, minimum, um, or criteria for, for the study. We'll get back to that. By default, we don't, we don't have that enabled to allow flexibility. We could. It's a good question that we could probably, by default, do some validation to rule out uh, absurd entries. Right. I just put everything in negative and then yeah. accept it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, good. Good comment. Okay. Um, and I submit it. And uh, now for me, I'm involved. You know, I'm in like ten studies, and so it's saying, "Hey, I have some other questionnaires. Do I want to fill, fill them out?" And I said, oh, "Okay." Okay. So here's here's a, here's a you know picture from that study. Do you recognize that button? Where where was that button from? Where, where did that button come from? We created it, right? Remember, it was bound to that survey. So I'm going to push that button, and you know, I'll put comma survey, right? It will say, "Are you currently outside?" And I'll say, "No, I'm not outside." Um, and I'm going to submit, um, and uh, it's again saying you have a backlog of surveys to fill. I've been teaching this one, so I should, I should uh, fill them out. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've just um, uh, I've I've uh, just gone and um, and uh, filled these out. Okay. Um, now, it's actually uh, got for me um, a set of these other ones. So I'm just going to work through those so that these don't get in the way of it, just so I can have the same experience as as you. Okay. Um, and here we go. Um, and uh, yes, okay. Um, and I am. It's it's being quite particular about me filling out some earlier surveys. Okay, fine. Um, yes, I'll I'll do this. Okay, please indicate the type of personal protective behavior uh, that I've been practicing. So I press the button, and it's asking me some questions. Do you see that? And so I I filled out some of these. Um, and it's asking me, could I take a photo of the tick, right? I'm going to say yes. And what should happen if I say yes? And I say submit. Well, then it should ask me, hey, take a photo, right? If I, if I were to say no, if I went back to previous and I were to say no, it's not going to ask me, okay? Um, and it's asking me about my emotional bond with dogs. Okay, no, no. Okay, I don't want to. Do that survey right now. Thanks very much. Um, uh, alternatively, if, if I said yes, I'll take a photo. Well, I'll go take a photo right now, and this will serve as here. I'll draw a tick. Right? Here's a here's a tick. I think they have eight legs. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, there we go. Okay. Go. Okay. So some of you may want to take photos. I'd encourage you to do so. Um, we'll see them in just a minute. Um, okay, so I just answered that survey. I'd encourage you folks to answer it because I'm going to go right now and look at the data. Okay, 
So, um, remember, I set up this, to go back to our, our sort of slides, I set up this study here. A participant, that's you and me, came and we enrolled in this study, right? Um, I could fill this out on an Android phone, an iPhone, starting this summer on the web. I could go back and forth between them and notice that's always me, and so all that data is linked up for me, whatever mode I tend to answer it. Um, uh, the web-based uh, one can be answered on a, done on a phone or on a browser, or on, a, on a desktop or laptop or what have you, any number of different ways. It's all, it's all going to the same place which is data storage up here that's accessible for the researcher dashboard. So if I go back to the researcher dashboard and I go and I take a look at this data, I could go to surveys and I could go to, res uh, to the responses to the surveys. I could say for all participants, sure, for all surveys, display responses. And there, ladies and gentlemen, are the various responses that have been made by the people in this room. Um, I like this one a great deal, um, and uh, others uh, have have opted to to not take take photos. Um, so, this is an example of the round trip of data here. Define the study. You folks joined it. You folks collected some data on the survey instruments we had defined. Submitted it, and notice that data, it didn't require you to do anything. It just got uploaded transparently. Whenever you're connected to a network, Ethica will try to find, you know, can it send data back to the mothership? It doesn't require the participants to do anything. But um, that data is uploaded, and it's available for browsers, for people on the research team or the study administration team to browse and to see. Okay, so this is an example of the type of data that is collected from phones and uploaded in response to a survey definition. And this data is additionally available for download. So we could go up here, for example, and download this as a CSV file if we want to analyze it and choose your favorite package, R, SAS, SPSS, whatever. Um, but this is just the survey side of things. Alternatively, now we're in a large building right now, so we're not actually going to see um, much in the way of, of geodata here. If we went and looked at, um, at surveys, for example, the found tick survey, and we were to say go, um, it said, look, there's 13 responses, but they didn't have location data. Why don't they have location data? Because we're inside a large building and GPS doesn't penetrate. We're going to have a break later, and I encourage you folks to go for a walk outside. Then we'll have lots of location data, okay? Um, we can, there's things we can do about this. There, we actually have very sophisticated indoor locationing that we've done with Wi-Fi to figure out where you are based on the Wi-Fi routers and their signal strengths, or based on Bluetooth beacons. We'll come to that later. We can pin things down to within centimeters using Bluetooth-type data inside. But for GPS, recognize there's limits to it. What this would show me once we're outside is when people answered a survey, it would post where they answered the different surveys on a map. We'll get to that. Okay. So we do have um, some sensor data, however, um, uh, experience here. So uh, in the sensor data side here, um, we can go and, for example, we could go um, uh, request the data export for example, of pedometry data, and I could ask it uh, for, for a set of participants here. Um, and, and whoop, excuse me, I didn't mean to close that. Um, uh, so this is pedometry collected here, and we could do an export, and we could uh, go and download it and have that data available. But often, you're not going to be immediately downloading it. Rather, we'll go up here to uh, take a look at participation, okay? And we can go look and see who's in this study. Well, I see there's a bunch of people in this study. Um, uh, how active have they been? Well, we have data information here on the last date they, they submitted data, when they joined the study, when their last formal day is in the study. Remember, we defined how long the participation period is. 
Um, and then to what degree have they been in contact with the system reliably, okay? You can actually go into more detail, for example, for the different types of information, uh, for example, GPS versus other types, um, uh, say accelerometry, what, um, what types of information. It also indicates the number of survey responses that they have provided over time and numbers that they have canceled, okay? Um, it will also show expired surveys. We'll be coming to that. So a big goal of Ethica is not just to allow definition of surveys. It's to monitor the data that's coming in to get a sense of how are things going. Who needs nudging? You know, who needs to be a bit reminded? In fact, there's automated mechanisms to do so. If we go over and look here, what you'll find is actually there's a bunch of different options here as well. Um, for example, we can extend the participation period for a participant, or we could label them in a certain way, or, or, or what have you. We can also note if a participant has multiple devices, okay, they're, they're accessing it from several devices. It'll, it'll keep track of that when different devices have been in use, et cetera. Okay, so monitoring adherence is often of, of real interest, and it turns out there's a more sophisticated interface yet for monitoring um, uh, their participation in surveys. So if I use myself as an example here and I say all surveys from uh, today to, well, today, or say tomorrow, and, um, and I say go, I can find out when surveys are scheduled to be delivered to me and whether I answered them or not, for example. Okay, so here, here's a couple of, of surveys. If I look further forward, uh, I could see, um, uh, you know, f further into the future when when certain surveys will be uh, will be issued, um, and I can also look at a data quantity report. So Ethica is a system that provides this administrative interface to make it easier to monitor uh, a study and operation. Beyond that, um, Ethica has a way of. of providing research teams access to this information on an ongoing basis. So later, we'll probably uh, do this in the later half of the session, I can add some of you, for example, as study co, co uh, members of the study team. And you can then help administer the study, okay? You could, for example, add surveys or modify existing surveys, push them out. There's quite sophisticated pers um, additional functionality that we'll get to, including the ability to push surveys to individuals, um, to, uh, to trigger surveys, for example, for particular individuals um, to whom you wish to, uh, to deliver a particular survey, maybe informational or to nudge them, to remind them to fill them out on escalating types of, inf uh, with escalating reminders on the phone notification, SMS messages, uh, email messages, to kind of nudge them um, when, they're, when they haven't responded for a certain amount of time. But I'll be covering that in a more systematic way uh, in, in just a few minutes. What I've provided here is a, um, is a simple sort of overview to, um, to uh, the very basics of the system. Um, and uh, I would note that we we saw this complete loop of defining a study, people joining a study, providing data, and browsing that in the administrative interface uh, as well. Um, I also showed how to download data, which at a practical level is also uh, very valuable. And we'll show a bunch of, of um, uh, ways of analyzing data um, uh, later, later in this session. Um, okay. Um, I would note that all the functionality we've seen in defining a study is also available in modifying it. So I can go back and add a survey anytime. I can go modify the data sources at a later point. I could add in a new data source or remove a data source if it's judged to be um, uh, not as uh, desirable as I wanted. Um, and I could go through and, and modify the criteria for issuing surveys, turn it from twice a day to once a day if it's too big a burden, et cetera. Okay? But this is the basic gist of it. Any questions on what I've shown, bearing in mind that I'm going to do a systematic coverage now, a walkthrough of Ethica's functionality that's much more detailed, 
But are there any overall questions um, that people would like to ask before I dive in? Uh, just out of curiosity, you all mean that in how or did you take like components from Lime Survey and integrate them? That's a good question. No, all of this is is built in house um, with the proviso that, as with any modern software development, we're using um, uh, existing platforms. So, for example, uh, using uh, Angular.js for for the uh, the the user interface components, Django for some of the web based functionality. Um, we use libraries on Android or iPhone, um, the Swift language on iPhone, or, or um, you know the Android uh, software development kit, all those sort of things. But it's all developed uh, in house. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you offer APIs for this? Or? Uh, there are. So it's a good question. There are some opportunities for. For interacting with the system programmatically, yes. For example, for analyzing data, um, we have uh, as researchers, we we are involved in dozens of uh, analysis efforts for different studies um, that directly talk to the Ethica database, and those use a um, a computational protocol. For, for accessing the data and, and reading it off uh, directly. There are additional APIs associated with writing plugins and uh, for writing extensions, which basically get displayed in Ethica for custom functionality. I'll mention a couple extensions, a time use extension, which allows people to record in a very lightweight way what activities they're engaged in with whom at what time. And, um, and then one for chat functionality uh, is another one. Um, uh, there's also some other plugins like the browsing plugin um, that adhere to interfaces. So there are some APIs for interfacing with Ethica to, um, to customize the functionality. And increasingly, over the next six months, but particularly a year, um, much of Ethica's development is being provided around allowing um, third parties or uh, as needed Ethica developers to, to allow for wholesale um, changes or extensions to the user interface of Ethica on a per study basis. So for example, a study we ran with Alberta Health Services used Alberta Health Services logos for, for their branding. Or studies we ran with Harvard did the same thing with, with uh, Project SNAP. Um, and there, um, there are some studies which have completely custom interfaces, like uh, for people to keep track of their goals or have contacts within their, their page for, for easy reach out to, uh, to loved ones, for individuals struggling with mental health issues. So um, Ethica is moving in a direction to take what we see now, which is the ability to customize different studies within some broad parameters, and take that to the next level with, um, with custom uh, look and feel. And that is being enabled through additional APIs that allow for these extensions um, and to some degree through plugins. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Maybe one last question, sorry, sure. because I'm leaving it one. Sure. Um, let's say an outside researcher, let's say from McGill University, wants yep. to engage yep. uh, in a research and yep. utilize your platform. What's the process? Is there a process? Yeah, the process is basically to um, to interface with. Um, so if you go to the Ethica website, um, mm -hmm. there's information to request a quote. Okay. So Ethica has a pricing model. Um, let me let me mention some broad features of the pricing model. Pricing is free for studies below a very small size, so people can experiment easily, try studies out, that sort of thing on very small scale. Beyond that, there is pricing, but it's graduated pricing, meaning it's different pricing based on the study configuration. So if a study is using High amounts it is is collecting very large amounts of data. Um, let's say uh, raw accelerometry data and gyroscope data. This is actually very large data that accumulates. And if you have thousands of participants, as several studies of ours do, 
at a time for one study. Um, you know, some studies have upwards of 5,000. Um, that actually accumulates to very large amounts of data. And it turns out that as costs, storage costs, but more to the point, costs for just sheer computational power needed to answer queries with respect to this data, to, to sort of show those analytics. We're gonna be going into custom analytics, custom visualization supported by what's called Kibana later in this session. And those provide really rich ways of visualizing information, but it, there's a lot of computational power when you have lots of data that's needed to create those visualizations. And in short, you need more machines and uh, more, more servers. And what this really means at a concrete level is that there's costs. And so um, if a study is merely using survey instruments, there's very little data and the costs are commensurately lower. If a study is using pedometry, GPS, and survey data, there's somewhat more data, so it's going to be more than surveys, but it's not going to be nearly as much as if you want accelerometry and, and you know, data related to, um, to, to gyroscope and to browsing behavior, et cetera. So there's a graduated pricing scheme um, on a per participant week per, per type of, of data source, where the data sources that are expensive are, are, the, are, are the ones that take lots of data. And as the study size grows, the per participant week per, per data source cost goes down. So there's a sort of a, uh, the marginal cost decreases as an economy of scale. And so it, it rises less quickly. Um, one of our goals with Ethica was to make sure we have at least cost recovery. Early on, we were hurting because we were offering a free model and people would, you know, they would just add everything. You know, what the hell? They'll just Sure, I'll have, I'll have all the data sources. And then that requires major amounts of storage, um, and it's not free. So um, we do have that, and also for servicing the study, for um, um, you know, support requests, um, answering questions from participants, all sorts of stuff like that. That's all part of service delivery. So there's, a, there's, a, there's costs associated with that. And if you go to the Ethica site, and I'll, I'll just go here if, if you want to see where it is, if you go to ethica.com, um, uh, and uh, you go here, you can find out about basic features, about some past studies, um, et cetera, and uh, you can go to the, uh, to the contact information here, okay? And uh, using that, you can submit a request, and they should get back to you uh, very, very quickly. I will also note, um, just because many people find it very useful, there's a community.ethicadata.com website <coughs> which provides extensive resources for people considering using Ethica. And you notice it's, uh, it's geared towards different communities here. But for researchers here, there's all sorts of information that can walk you through sophisticated uh, questions, including information about the structure of common data sources, exactly what information is provided for what data source, basically um, code books that describe to you what you know, different codes mean in different fields or how to interpret a given field, et cetera. So this community.ethica data is also valuable. But contacting Ethica through that uh, contact form is the best way. We tried to make sure that the costs do not block any study from getting going. If, if, if there's a, a realistic assessment that, you know, you'd like to run a study um, and you're willing to economize some, et cetera, and you just don't have the level of resources needed to pay the full cost, you can negotiate, basically. And, and we, try to, we try to enable what we can with it. So um, that's the basic deal. We used to have a pricing scheme on, but there's so many variations because a lot of people's requests involve um, special configurations or even requests to add something to Ethica. For example, someone, you know, two years ago wanted a calendar. They wanted a calendar extension. That's been done. Other people wanted a video recording, you know, for their study. And Ethica often does these things directly because they're planning to roll it out, they won't charge for it. You know, they say, okay, that's something, it could help lots of studies. Yeah, we'll do that for your study. and, and or they'll say, well, that's kind of specific to your study, so we'll charge you, you know, a little bit of money for the custom development to, to roll that out, but from then on, it'll be available to you or others, okay? So there's a lot of back and forth. There's one, one question from the chat. Okay. 
to find the, the photo format. Yeah, it's a JPEG. It's a JPEG. Um, uh, so um, uh, I'll be showing that later. I'll, uh, we can actually go right now. So this was a question about um, can I define the file format of a photo that's taken as part of a survey? Um, I believe it's the native one on that platform, though. I said it's a JPEG, but um, if we go to responses here and we go to look at responses to all surveys, and I do um, do this, uh, this, this um, uh, is the, the full image here, and I can actually do save image as, um, and you can see this. But if I actually downloaded it, you notice earlier I downloaded this, um, and um, I will go uh, just go back to that. I'm going to go to my downloads. Uh, and uh, here uh, in my downloads, forgive me, I have a lot of downloads here. Um, uh, here are my survey responses. I'm going to extract those. Here we go. And I will uh, go into responses here. And here are a set of survey responses for different participants. I'm going to open with, uh, okay, this person actually does, uh, looks like they, the, the, uh, these are, oh, these are to different surveys, that's it. Um, so that's why there are these uh, different, different names here. Um, if I went to open these here, what you'll find is, okay, this is a username on this device at this time, issued a survey, they responded at this time. This is the amount of time till they responded between the issuing of the survey and when they responded to it. Um, this is how they responded. This is uh, to different questions. And this, this is a pointer to the actual image, okay? Um, now, I believe if your phone recorded it as a PNG or, you know, GIF or TIFF or what have you, I believe this would, would be whatever file type is used on the phone. So I, I hope, that's, uh, hope that's helpful. Other questions? Yes. Is there, like, uh, suppose if the app doesn't work on the participant side, mm. is there any troubleshooting that you can Yes, do? absolutely. So uh, if, if there's issues on the participant side, Ethical wants to know about them as soon as possible. I will tell you that in, in, the, in the code base to support the app, um, there's uh, a set of information that's recording what's going on in the app at a detailed level that's available to software developers. Um, and what that allows them to do is to look and quickly often track down, oh, there's this issue with the phone. For example, there's certain models of phone. Um, I happen to have a Huawei phone, okay? And Huawei um, um, is known to have certain, um, certain issues with uh, notifications and permissions that need to be custom set when you first install Ethica. And Ethica actually will warn you about it and walk you through that. Now, this differs a little bit by different manufacturers, I mean, a lot by different manufacturers. That's Huawei. I think there's one or two other models. I think it's one other type of phone that has these issues. But if, if someone's encountering an issue, we want to know about, about it as soon as possible. And so, and they can help with looking at that information and saying, okay, uh, this is what the issue is, we'll roll out a fix or whatever. And they tend to be very responsive to that. Okay, so good. Other questions? Okay, so um, that was a quick glimpse of the system. What I'm going to do now um, is, uh, is start a little bit on um, a more formal presentation side. And we're gonna take a break in about um, uh, about half an hour, okay? And, um, and I'd encourage people to stretch their legs a bit. I'm gonna go outside and, and we'll see some GPS data after that, okay? Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, uh, Creating a study, um, we saw this earlier, study name, consent form, and institution name. Um, and uh, Ethica allows multiple types of, of studies, single cohorts, rolling cohorts, and panel uh, panels, okay? So um, uh, here, each of them is defined by different combinations. Um, so, uh, you know, we can have 
everyone starting and stopping at the same time, a rolling participation for a defined time, or panels, you know, people can join and then be in it indefinitely from then on, right? Um, uh, and uh, we spoke about the types uh, earlier um, for context. So data sources have a lot of specifics. I would note that a subset of these data sources, and an important subset, is only available on, are only available on Android, okay? I highlight this um, uh, in case any of you are interested. And I wanna, I wanna mention the particular ones and distinguish them from others that might be confused. So one of them is Bluetooth. But this is quite different from beacons. Uh, iPhone and Android support what's called Bluetooth beacons, which allows me to track if I'm near a beacon. What this is speaking about Bluetooth is actually phone-to-phone -phone detection, like my phone detecting your phone directly. You're not carrying a beacon, I'm not carrying a beacon, but we know we're in proximity. You can do that in Android. iOS does not allow it as a security precaution. But if, if, I, if you carry a beacon, I can detect you, and, and if I carry a beacon, you can detect me, and generally the beacons are, can be very small, and, and that's what we do generally to allow iOS the iPhone to support it. Call logs are another thing only supported on Android if we want to get information about when people call out or, or receive a call. Um, that's only uh, something that they can only, uh, we only support on, on Android because it's not allowed on iOS. These are basically the iOS restrictions, um, the starred ones. SMS logs, the messages I send or receive. If we want to monitor communicational behavior or affiliative behavior through communication, Really, we're, we're somewhat limited with, with iOS. Um, browsing history, it's really an Android thing. iOS just doesn't, doesn't allow us to track uh, browsing. On Android, we can track it across multiple browsers. I, Firefox, Chrome, built-in browsers, we can track. Um, ambient temperature, light, pressure, proximity, humidity. These are things supported by some phones. Um, if you're interested in the spread of nosocomial infection, hospital-acquired illness, for example, or you want to understand um, someone's uh, social determinants of health, maybe uh, poor, the impact of poor housing stock on high humidity levels that might cause black mold exposure, et cetera. Um, environmental environmental um, sensors can be of interest, but they're, they're, they're not uh, available on iPhone. So they're available on Android phones. And not all Android phones have these, the ones that do. The final one that's, that's uh, phone type specific is Wi-Fi. Okay, now, you might find that odd. Does that mean Ethica can't send data over? No, it has nothing to do with sending data. On both iPhone and Android, it sends data over Wi-Fi. This is about detecting Wi-Fi routers and their signal strength. Why would I do that? Well, it allows me to figure out where I am in a hospital or in a facility of some sort. By, by seeing the Wi-Fi around, knowing what Wi-Fi router is around, I can pin down where people are quite well. Um, at the U of S, um, we can pin down within about a meter or two where people are inside. Inside large buildings where GPS data just doesn't make it, Wi-Fi will give us that. But, but iOS doesn't allow it. Um, it doesn't allow apps to look and say, tell me about the nearby Wi-Fi points. Um, the others are, and, and most are available across platforms, including app use, screen state, et cetera. Yeah, so just going back to Wi-Fi, so yeah. like if I walk down McGill with this yeah. on and you're reflecting it, you yeah. pick up the, wi the name of the Wi-Fi network? Yeah, if, if you've enabled Wi-Fi as a data source. Okay, you wouldn't need the names ahead of time? No, All right. no, it'll pick up. It'll pick up the, I believe, the SSID. It'll pick up the MAC, the Wi-Fi MAC address, it's called. Um, it'll pick up uh, signal strength, um, RSSI, Receive Signal Strength Indicator, um, which you have to be careful in interpreting because I think uh, you want a value that's close to zero as possible. The larger the negative value, it's like zero or, or lower. And um, in other words, like negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, and those reflect uh, diminishing levels of, of signal strength. Um, but yeah, it'll, it can enumerate uh, nearby routers. Um, and, and it can, I think it may sometimes find the same router, same physical router on different networks. So like EduRealm or McGill Public, or for example, 
Um, they may be associated with the same router number, but different SSIDs. Okay. Um, so um, uh, that's uh, why. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Um, I will. So I, I will just note here. What we're looking at is a broad smorgasbord of different options. Um, be aware that you want to know when you're planning a study, you want to know how you're planning to use this. These you don't you don't want to just say, well, what the heck, collect everything. Um, you you want to be asking a research question. For example, if you're interested in mental health issues and the impact, and and you think that screen screen time and and, and phone use may play a role in mental health. Um, uh, both, both as a, a conduit for a connection, perhaps, and um, and in terms of um, unhealthy use of devices, et cetera, which you know a lot has been written on. You might want to use screen state and app use. Um, you know, uh, find those of, of particular interest. Um, conceivably, you'd be interested in in, in using beacons to track um, uh, social social context. Um, if, if you're dealing with an individual with schizophrenia and you want to understand their social support networks or what have you, or maybe their location and use that as a proxy instead for if they're at home or outside, for example, use that as a sign of who, they're, who they might be with. Um, but you know, for a study on physical activity, um, uh, you, you conceivably might use app use, but it's probably pretty aside from your interest. Maybe screen state if you're trying to understand how does that vary with with a sedentary behavior and physical activity, but a lot of your attention will be on pedometry. Um, and you can use the onboard pedometer, or you could use a pedometer from Google Fit devices, for example, from, from, from wearables. So you want to be uh, clear about you know, what you're asking about. Um, also, uh, for example, sleep um, uh, you know, it might be something you're interested in, and really that's one that you'd look to uh, Fitbit uh, devices uh, devices for. So just be aware, a given study will use a small subset of these typically, right? And be aware also, in terms of analysis, uh, the more of these you need, often you start tapping into data science techniques to analyze this. Because if you're getting sophisticated uh, data over time, for example, on accelerometry, you really need uh, something you know much much more detailed than a you know, a, an aggregate logistic regression equation. You're, you, you really want to take advantage of the fine-grained nature of the data. So you start using machine learning approaches and, and structured ways of analyzing. Even something like screen state, we find it really useful to analyze with a hidden Markov model, which has been used for several studies to, to analyze what's the, what's the underlying screen state of the, of the system, um, given uh, data gaps in between measurements, et cetera. Okay, so surveys, uh, we saw eligibility, baseline survey. There's a set of EMAs, uh, ecological momentary assessments. Some are user triggered, some are scheduled triggered, some are proximity triggered. Here we can trigger them based on proximity to a beacon, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and there's an advanced triggering which could be on custom logic. So if you want to trigger a survey based on when you're in a park, or you're near, um, uh, you're, you're near your home, or you're, you're plausibly at home, um, you want to trigger it based on when you're making some travel, um, you'd, you'd really want to think about an advanced trigger. Um, this might use all sorts of different data. Um, it might also use, may it also be contingent on certain responses you gave um, earlier. Um, and, and then there's an exit survey. If, if they ask to drop out, you can, you can ask uh, questions why. So generally speaking, you know, within the context of a, of a study, there'll be some participation period, and there'll be some ongoing data collection. And some of that data collection might trigger surveys, right? Like contextual surveys triggered by GPS, for example, or by proximity. Um, uh, so Bluetooth beacons, for example, might might trigger uh, trigger some some surveys. Um, uh, other sensor data might be collected on an ongoing basis, and there might be some that are just randomly asked once a day, or five times a day, or or they're asked at certain times. You know, 8 a.m., uh, 12 noon, and 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. You know, they're asked at, at regular times. Um, 
And uh, in the course of a day, you'll often have a number of surveys asked. Um, during our boot camp, we cover uh, principles of good study design. And one of the things we've learned is that people generally respond pretty well, even to multiple surveys a day, if you keep them short. And so keeping the survey sh fairly short is important, even if it means you break it up into different instruments um, that are asked uh, at, different, at different times. It is possible to make issuing of one survey depend on how they answered previous surveys. That's certainly possible. And you can also base occurrence of a survey based on baseline questions. So for example, if someone uh, reports their um, self-identified gender earlier, surveys can be made contingent upon that reported gender. So there's certain questions asked only of men or only of women, etc. cetera. Um, so there can be dependencies uh, between those. Um, so user triggered uh, questions, again, are, uh, allow us to, to create buttons. Scheduled ones um, um, you know, are triggered right now by notifications on the phone. Soon, um, within the next few months, this is going to broaden to also allow people to get SMS messages to fill out a survey. Um, so to be reached out to on SMS or emails, they can fill it out there. If they have Ethica on their phone and they click on one of those emails or SMS, it will fill it out with Ethica, the app. But if they don't, it will fill it out with browser and they can submit. Um, so it's not dependent on browser, right? The goal is. Ethica studies should not require the Ethica app. Ethica app is makes some tasks easier for the brow or for the user, um, uh, and certainly enables certain types of sensor-based data collection. But um, for many studies, they may wish to allow participants um, to not download the app, but still have wearable devices which have that sensor data and have the option of filling out the surveys through the browser if they don't want to use the app. The app is a convenience, not a requirement. Um, so uh, with surveys, uh, scheduled surveys, um, there's, um, there's a report on when they'll be issued, and you can see that inside the administrative interface for each user as well. Okay. Um, proximity trigger is based on a sophisticated set of triggering conditions that are um, that are beyond the, the scope of, of this tutorial. But fundamentally, um, using what are called Bluetooth beacons, which can vary in size from sort of postage stamp size, um, small, really almost innocuous uh, things to to, to larger ones like are placed in the collars of dogs that are waterproof and last for years and are, are, are very, very resistant and tough. Um, basically, we can associate beacons with certain information. These include structure like teams, roles within teams, and a, a subject. And there's a detailed tutorial on, on how you can uh, undertake this or detailed instructions. Um, and so, for example, we might have an egocentric network. I don't know if you're familiar with those notions, but this might be a network enrolled through um, uh, respondent-driven sampling or snowball sampling where I mention some of my contacts. And maybe I form a team with the people I mention, um, and they're around me. Um, and maybe within that team, we track smokers and non-smokers. So we could have roles being smokers and non-smokers, teams being sort of the, the egocentric networks um, uh, around a person, um, and a subject ID uh, paired with a beacon so we know which beacon goes with what person. And then we could trigger, for example, a questionnaire when a non-smoker spends time with a smoker. We could ask some questions of each appropriate to that. Or we could trigger something when a person sees their clinician um, or is in the doctor's office. Um, we could trigger when an individual is in their vehicle by putting a beacon in the vehicle. So sometimes beacons mark resources. Sometimes they mark actors. Uh, sometimes they mark locations. Okay. Um, often they mark other participants. Um, there is the option with Android right now 
It's not strongly recommended because security restrictions change over time, but there is the option right now of Android phones dealing with each other as well. Um, but but uh, for it to be cross-platform, I suggest use of Beacon. Um, uh, okay, so um, no, more, no more questions uh, remotely there. Um, so uh, after the beacons are configured, they can add surveys with this, pro uh, this triggering, and you can see there's uh, some quite, um, uh, quite sophisticated rules. So like, when is it triggered? Is it when I, I meet someone of a, of a certain role, for example? Um, is, it, is it triggered when I'm not near someone from a certain time, for example? Um, and, uh, oh, I've forgotten to mention, this is very important. Um, with each survey, you can specify how long it is till it expires. What I mean by that is if it fires off, this is less of an issue with a button, right? But if a, if a survey pops up at a certain time, randomly, um, it, it should have an expiration time, right? So maybe, maybe it's something I really want that answer right now, and if I can't get it, it's not worth anything, right? Um, and so then I would have it expire within five or 10 minutes, maybe. But on the other hand, maybe, maybe for certain surveys, as long as they fill it out, I'm okay if they wait to the end of the day or wait till after class is done or you know till they till they get a break at work or whatever. In which case, I might set the expiration to be a few hours, even, um, or even a day, or even no expiration. Um, and so you can set this with surveys, and um, uh, and that's in general. Um, uh, I should note that beacons. You can also set a criteria that basically reflects how close does a resource have to be. So um, this is something called the RSSI, Receive Signal Strength Indicator. I answered a question, uh, or I commented on a question. The RSSI basically gives the threshold of how strong does the signal have to be. So if I'm really far, far from my service dog, you know, I'm across the house or I'm outside and the dog's inside or vice versa, Maybe I don't want the survey to trigger. I really want it if they're within a few meters of me. I can set a signal strength indicator accordingly, or a parent to their child, for example. You want it, you know, you want it to be when they're spending time with their child, and so you can set set this to, to trigger accordingly, right? Um, incidentally, another big use whoa, of beacons is if you have actors that are not in the that are not carrying phones, they're not phone carriers. But you want to you wanna know about their presence? Example, patients in a facility who come and go. You give them a little badge, it has a beacon in there, and you know when there are patients nearby or something like that. There's ethical, um, ethical uh, you know, processes that have to be followed there. They, they need to know something about this. But the point is, it's a very lightweight thing. They don't have to install an app. They don't have to do anything to... to, to, to you know, active to get on there. Children and parents, where children, you don't want to have to carry a phone, right? And, and maybe for ethical reasons, you don't want to give them a phone. Um, you know, you, you have them carry a beacon, right? Um, uh, dogs are unlikely to make good use of a phone, so, you know, you give them a beacon, right? um, Put it on their collar. So uh, surveys uh, consist of sequences of pages. Each page is a sequence of questions. And each question can have a sequence of potential answers. We saw this, right? Um, uh, surveys are also ways of delivering interventions. For example, we have surveys that have cognitive tasks as part of it. These are, these are validated instruments for testing certain things like reaction times or recognition tasks that might be used in mental, ass mental assessments of mental acuity, et cetera. Um, psychometric tests, in short, and surveys like this can be very sophisticated. And um, for a given study, uh, it turns out you can have custom uh, tests of that sort, psychometric tests that can be inserted into Ethica without requiring changes to Ethica software per se. Okay, um, and that's a, an area of considerable use. Um, and uh, surveys can also be a way of presenting participants with visualization of their own data using uh, extensions, okay? The data that they've offered up. Um, they can offer content, like multimedia content, video, so that people can play the video in the survey. 
that, that is provided as part of the survey. They can also record video as a video question in a survey, but I'm talking about where the survey itself contains video that they watch as part of the survey or they have recourse to. So maybe it's a person with limited literacy and the video gives them a walkthrough and language that they understand, right? Barcode scanning is supported. Um, so you can scan barcodes and, and get that. You can have uh, graphical items, for example. You can ask them to take photos, etc. audio. Um, visual analog scales, and this is psychometric uh, testing um, there. So there's a wide variety of options with surveys. Yeah, there's some chunk so, Well, you mentioned a couple of tasks. Yeah. So what about the, those existing cognitive package? Mm. So you embedded it. That, that's a good question. So if there's a complete, you're saying, package associated with uh, psychometric tests. Yeah. Um, right now, we don't have uh, a set. Uh, so we have um, certain standardized instruments uh, available as psychometric tests. Mm -hmm. we, I would say it's a small but growing set. If there were a complete package of some sort, I think you'd want to discuss... Uh, with the Ethica developers, how that would um, could be interfaced via Ethica via an extension, and I think you'd find them quite interested in this. And mm -hmm. it might be that it could be supported with Ethica basically being a window into that package, and they could interact with it through Ethica, um, but it would be a, a battery of different tests. Um, and I'd be interested in talking more because I'm fairly new to the specific specifics of some of the tests that they support. Yeah. But a lot of the tests involve uh, reaction times and, and animations, right. etc. Right. Because I actually explore a few cognitive packages uh -huh, okay. from NIH and NIH. Ah. And they all have a different version. Okay. The NIH, they already have an iPad version. Okay. So then you can just like another app download it and play it. Right. And then if Attica comes with the browser version, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that, Chung Feng, because um, at already Ethica supports for this um, so called basic income study, this large multi thousand um, studies um, uh, running out of the Bay Area. They already are providing uh, linkages to web-based um, data entry mechanism hosted by other sites. And that's with basically a browser window. The user doesn't really know it's a browser. It's, it just looks like a, you know, it, it shows whatever it is. But secretly, it's a browser viewing a site online. And the only trick is getting it to pass like uh, username, password information, that sort of stuff. But Ethica has interfaces for doing exactly that. So if there's an online site mm -hmm. that supports the tests, maybe this, and it's a standardized test um, design, probably the simplest thing is to set Ethica extension up to view that through Ethica. Mm -hmm. And they do that now with certain sites and they pass username, password, et cetera. So that would probably be the most obvious, immediate way to use it, in which case you could legitimately say it's provided, you know, the timing is being done through this NIH mechanism or, or this mechanism online. It's just that, that Ethica is a portal or a browser uh, is, a, is a conduit to it. Yeah. And that would probably be the advised way to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the direction that Ethica is going to be able to wrap up resources that are actually located elsewhere and uh, provide access to them while still supporting um, Ethica functionality all around it and linking it with Ethica's data right. Right, um, on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, so this is an example of a psychometric uh, uh, test instrument there. Now, I had shown earlier um, criteria and skip patterns. Um, there's two major um, things to know about this, or, or a couple major things to know. One is that uh, pages, remember we saw earlier I defined a page, and I made that page 
be enabled uh, based on the answer to a question? Remember, I, I said only, uh, yeah, if they, only if they said they could take a photo, would I show this page? That's one way in which we refer to things. You can also do so at the level of questions. Had I time, I would show this, okay? The level of individual questions, they can be shown or not within a page, enabled or disabled, um, based on an earlier question. And this capacity extends not just within the same survey, but you can actually refer to questions on other surveys, okay? So you can refer to how they answered the baseline survey, for example, by, and refer to a certain question and uh, a certain survey ID, and, and can put in criteria for this. And this allows you to do branching and skip patterns by defining criteria at the page level, you can also do this to enable and disable uh, a question. You can also populate a certain question's most recent response in the content of another question. So if I want to ask you a question, you know, um, um, when was the last time you saw so-and-so, um, it can actually fill in the name of a, of a social contact for this person, a social support person, and fill in that name. It's variable substitution. Can I ask, you know, when was the last time you saw John? And 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 put this in based on an answer to a, a previous question, potentially on a different survey. Okay, um, and um, and and this is uh, allows for um, for substituting in information. This is an example of substitution, but the the resulting question basically uses a response that they issued answered before as a um, priority for themselves. So this is which of the following steps you're going to take towards your social goal of, and now you're going to ask them about one of their social goals that they put as a priority. This is, I think, for individuals with schizophrenia. And maybe one of it was, um, or with it, perhaps it was anxiety disorder for this one, make a new friend by going to events you're interested in. So it actually substitutes that in here based on their answer to another survey. Um, final comments I'm going to make before a break here. Ethica supports randomization at several different levels. Randomization can be applied to pick random questions uh, to display, or ordering different items in random ways so that you don't always get the same question above the other question. Why would you do that? Well, you, um, so that you can normalize for, avoid being, you know, having your, your results skewed by the happenstance of which order questions were in. So you can do randomization of answers within a question so the same answer is not always first. Questions within a page or pages within a survey. So, so that's a, a form of, of randomization that can allow surveys to, um, um, uh, to, to capture uh, uh, some variability that can help lower the impacts of, of survey structure in, in shaping, uh, shaping results. Um, at the end of a survey, people can press submit. Um, Participants can cancel a survey. Um, generally, they will um, they'll be asked if there's things they didn't fill in. Do they sh are they sure they want to leave this survey? And, and they can answer. Um, right now, people can go back to earlier items they filled out on the survey in earlier pages. But right now, we don't have a summary that provided, like, you answered these questions. Rather, they can go back and look at it. Um, for earlier uh, pages. There's some requests for surveys, et cetera. I think now is a good time uh, for breaks. Um, I'll put up a few of these extensions if anyone's interested in looking at them. But why don't we take a, a 10 minute break if we could? Um, uh, and uh, let's say 10 to 15 minutes, we'll see when people come back here. Um, and we'll, we'll recon, re reconvene here. And I'll cover aspects of extensions um, and a set of additional sophisticated functionality for, for Ethica. Uh, we will also take a look at Kibana. Kibana is a system that's similar to Tableau. I don't know if any of you know Tableau. It's a visualization package that's often used with big data. 
Kibana is an open source one that is integrated tightly with Ethica. And you can use it to build custom visualizations and analytics for your study and share them with other people, either in an updating way or snapshot sort of way. Okay? So we'll take a quick look at that and how it can be used to create different uh, visualizations. Okay? So uh, we'll come back in 10 or 15 minutes and, um, and continue on with that material. Thanks very much. So you just have the host capabilities on there, right? You're using his for the display? Yep. <clears throat> so you can just go to... So if you... Right. You might need to uh, turn on your speaker if you want to hear questions. Like oh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid of the feedback, but uh, should we try it? Or perhaps if you, if you move your microphone away. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Okay, or we can uh, move but it But you can here. keep it muted when, uh, yeah. you know, only open when you, you, you want to get... Maybe, maybe for in the interest of time, I'll keep my eye open for these typed questions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you very much again, Andrea. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, uh, so uh, in in uh, the balance of the session, I'd like to go through a couple of key items with Ethica. Key for understanding its full power and generality. Um, one of them is uh, concerns the notion of an extension. Okay. An extension in Ethica is a um, mechanism that allows new features to be added to the app without requiring a totally custom version of the app. Um, and uh, the idea is that each extension is implemented in a simpler way than if it were added to the app as a, as a complete unit um, and then integrated with the app as an entire thing. And um, these extensions are not solitudes. They can actually access the other data collected by Ethica. Okay? So um, within this sphere, uh, Ethica currently has uh, several, several extensions. Um, and uh, one of them is the chat extension. Um, this allows individuals to chat with other participants or with uh, study coordinators, um, say, for support needs. Um, Another one is the time use extension, which provides uh, mechanisms for entering activities um, at different times during the day, with whom they're doing it, um, where, where they're uh, pursuing that activity. There's additional um, capacity to issue psychometric instruments that I showed earlier that's provided, um, which, which makes use of what's known as a JavaScript mechanism for describing the functionality of the psychometric instrument. Um, additionally, Ethica either now has or is in the process of, of implementing for very rapid rollout, I think within the next month, of, um, for, the, for the basic income study I mentioned in the Bay Area, an extension which allows Ethica, Ethica as a whole to access secretly through a browser content online. So it can show within Ethica, as if it's an Ethica page, content which is available elsewhere. Even where that content is only accessed via username and password, it will show kind of a window on that and show that content within the Ethica app as if it were part of Ethica. Now, uh, I think to bear in mind, this it does require the user to be online. Um, by contrast, the rest of Ethica does not. Um, you can use Ethica completely offline if you're in a subway without internet or you're out canoeing or you're, you know, up on a reserve and there's, there's no uh, 3G or 4G available. Okay. Um, participants, I, I wanted to mention, can enroll in one of several ways. We actually saw this, this most uh, uh, sort of brute force way where people have the app already, they downloaded it, they've installed it. And now they can press uh, through that menu item, they can join a study and enter the study code. That's more cumbersome. It requires someone to enter the study code. By contrast, for most studies, we either support it via mail through a link, where the link actually will download the app when they click on it from a, from a, a proper consent, consented status, download the app, it will enroll them in that particular study. 
Okay. Um, if if the app's already installed, it just enrolls. Them. If it's not installed, it downloads it and and enrolls them. Okay. So that's a simpler mechanism. Some studies also use QR codes or a registration link, a URL, um, to, to achieve the same effect. Okay. So participants can enroll in, in several different ways. Um, in many studies, they have to pass an eligibility survey. We didn't show this in our example in the interest of time. But um, for example, a, a, a survey associated with a study can be deemed to be an eligibility survey. This is a unique one because it is filled out prior to them joining the study. And it, it's a gating survey that can determine can they proceed to, to go through the consent process and finish. And as such, it has a different status in terms of data collection and so on. This, is, this might be someone who fills this out that's not a participant, right? Um, uh, if someone passes the, the criteria for that, for that survey, they're passed the consent process and then they can, um, they can be enrolled in the study. If a person is already in different studies, they can join yet another. I have, I don't know, a dozen studies on my phone that, that I participate in and um, I get asked different questions by those different studies. Certain types of information, maybe my screen state or my uh, pedometer count is collected by multiple studies. But it only requires collecting it once. It just passes it to these different studies, which, which can then make use of it uh, as, they, as they will. Um, uh, so data collection starts immediately after a participant registers in the study. It's, it doesn't start with the, the eligibility survey. That's a gating, gating mechanism. Um, and uh, it continues during times where there's certain criteria is achieved. This is, these are very important because they get into issues of, of privacy. Once I'm in this study, that doesn't mean I'm always willing to provide data. We provide, and if you go look in your app, if you go up to the menu, that same menu you used to enroll in the study, there's a pause participation button. Do you see that? And if you press that, it will pause your data collection for an hour's time. That allows you to achieve some privacy to request privacy for a defined time. Okay? Um, uh, in addition, it is possible for a user, for example, to turn off GPS. You, know, you might turn GPS off for your phone. Um, alternatively, uh, you might, from the app, disable optional data sources. If you designate it as an optional data source, they could disable that data source from the app itself. Um, and uh, the participant um, also needs to grant permission. So when they first install Ethica and start, up the, uh, start the study, um, they'll be asked, do they provide permission to collect certain types of information? If they elect no, it won't be collecting that information. Um, and uh, if they do disable data collection, um, uh, they will be receive notifications reminding them to re-enable it. So if GPS is disabled, we'll say, we notice your GPS is disabled. Um, um, the study does require it, you know, uh, um, it, you know please, please re-enable it, but we won't force it, okay? So for privacy reasons, this is extremely important. Is it a problem? Does it happen often that you... No, not too much. Uh, GPS is more common um, uh, as, as a specific data source um, that is not available, but there's two reasons for that. One of them is inside a large building, it's, it's challenging to get GPS, but another reason is some people turn it off for um, power savings, and that yeah. does sometimes happen. Um, other sur other uh, types of um, sensor data, um, we haven't really seen a, a similar issue. You'll notice that um, in the adherence report, we can see actually when GPS is collected here, and you'll see these little gaps here that indicate okay, GPS was absent, you know, during that that time. There's data quantity reports that report the amount of data collected for different devices. I'm not going to have time to go through there. And there's a map that shows. Over time, for the surveys that someone um, that someone was scheduled to fill out, which of them did they actually complete? Which did they not complete? Which expired? Which are yet to be asked? 
Um, and it, and there's a little graph there showing, you know, how much of each. Yes. And GPS generally is mm -hmm. uh, very power hungry. Yes. And is it constant or like? Oh, um, great question. Ethica, in contrast to an app like um, Maps on either iPhone or, or or Android, which use GPS pretty much on a continuous basis while you're in it, mm -hmm. Ethica samples it on a more parsimonious manner. Okay, so it'll sample it, uh, you know, once every five minutes or a few times within five minutes, but it won't constantly be trying to update that little blue dot on the map mm -hmm. showing where you are. So it tends to be less power intensive. But sometimes people turn GPS off for other reasons because their phone's getting low on power and Ethica is, sort of has collateral damage for that. Um, what I will say is that Ethica takes more power if you are collecting more, ser more sensor data, so accelerometry, gyroscope. Um, these are very data intensive things. Audio or recording video, um, these are very, very heavy duty things and and it will use more power. If you're if you're doing you know surveys, pedometer, GPS, it's it, it tends to be a lot less. A lot less. Um, we haven't when we started Ethica, the IEP project, power management was a huge issue we we're constantly facing. And we had to do a lot of sweating to get it acceptable um, in terms of power use. Um, a lot of the engineering went into to dealing with that. These days, we're pretty much beyond that, um, that time, um, and the constraints have actually shifted. And I will mention, this is an important thing to know about, on iPhones, iPhones have, and I've covered these more in the coming boot camp, if any of you are interested. We go into much more detail about things and with, with stories about this. iPhones have a fairly aggressive um, policy for managing apps that take a lot of um, resources, including power, but also computation. And so studies that collect very high amounts of sensor data, um, again, I mentioned some accelerometry, uh, gyroscope. Um, I put in there, uh, you know, GPS is something that takes a moderate amount of power. Um, uh, but ambient audio, recording audio every few minutes or something like that. Studies which record a lot, what happens is Ethica will sometimes get killed, okay? When I say killed, it'll be, it'll come back in a few minutes, but it actually like gets knocked out of memory. iPhone says like, you're not behaving well, go into the corner. And so I think it goes in the corner and then it comes out again. And, um, and uh, what this leads to is kind of gaps of a few minutes in the record. Um, sometimes it might be 10 minutes. And, and so sometimes less is more. You know, you, you, it's much more, less likely to get, to, I mean, we don't see this issue on iPhones for most of our studies because we're not that aggressive at collecting sensor data. But studies which are, they may, they may lose some data because of it. So again, less is more if you can constrain yourself in terms of the amount of data that, that you collect. Um, Okay, um, so uh, I should probably uh, show you uh, here. Okay, here's our, here's our study. Um, uh, we, we have um, adherence uh, reports here from earlier. Um, now, I happen to know I'm uh, 2875, and you notice I've been actually getting uh, some, uh, some GPS data here. Um, I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to select all participants um, and um, I'm actually going to, excuse me, I didn't actually think to fill out a survey. I should have reported a, should have reported a tick while I was in Starbucks, although they might not have liked that. Um, but if I want to see sort of um, where, uh, where I am over time, um, it's possible to use uh, these interfaces to display what's called a heat map interface or or a um, or a uh, trajectory interface. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show just myself. So this is showing my trip to Starbucks, right? <laughs> um, uh, you can see that I I walk down, and if you if you go and you um, throttle the the time here, um, you'll find okay here 
here I was, uh, I was walking down that street, and there I went, and there I came back. Do you see that? Um, so I'm, I'm going sort of forward in time now, and, and soon you'll start to see the, the telltale side. So this is us walking to Starbucks. There we go. And uh, we were on this corner for, we were on one of these corners for a bit of time, okay. And now I'm coming back, you see that? Um, so this is tracing my route, route back, right? Um, if I had more data, it would be more compelling, but I could show what's called a heat map. It turns out that if I had answered surveys, um, it'll also geolocate all the survey responses, okay? And it'll show me what I answered um, in terms of audio and so on. This is what the heat map looks like. Um, by contrast, this is the trajectory I followed for a particular uh, participant, right? Um, uh, so Ethica has a set of tools for visualizing geodata uh, that are built in, but a much greater level of sophistication in, in displaying data comes from this tool called Kibana, okay? Um, this is a Apache project for those who, who know what that is. Um, uh, and it's an open source project that's been integrated with, with, uh, with it, um, Ethica. And at a practical level, what that means is it has um, very quick access to Ethica data for summarizing it. Um, and you can create different visualizations for a given study to show information such as networks that have been collected, or to show geodata, such as a heat map, or to show behavior over time, such as involving pedometer counts or when the screen is, has been turned on or off, um, uh, or aspects of, of, say, average counts on a per day basis for, for pedometry. Um, so um, uh, this is used for, for a variety of visualizations. We'll see it more in just a moment. Another option is to export data. I showed you earlier that you can download data from Ethica. Um, and a bunch of different formats. GPS data supports not just CSV, but a, a bunch of other formats like KML that can be displayed in, in, um, in GPS, the GIS oriented packages. Survey responses can be provided at CSV or, or, or JSON files, which is a, a more computationally widely used technique uh, uh, format. Uh, Bluetooth can be exported as network connections or as uh, CSV and uh, other types can be exported as CSV. These files can be very large for certain sensor data, so be aware that sometimes Ethica requires a bit of time to export it. Um, um, I, I, I won't go into this. Um, I'll just note there's a variety of specific topics before I jump to Kibana on the site. There's a variety of topics I haven't covered here that are significant. One of them is Ethica supports multiple time zones very clearly. All the data is, is time stamped uh, by a time zone. When I'm viewing the data as a researcher, um, you sometimes want to be aware that the people in the study may have been collecting the data at a different time zone than yourself. Ethica keeps track of all of that, but just be aware that in terms of interpretation, mm -hmm. that may lead to them you know, um, having having patterns, circadian rhythms that are different from what you expect, but maybe it's because they're in, you know, they're halfway across the world. Um, it has complete offline support, so you can go online and offline with Ethica by itself with, with no issues. It's opportunistic in uploading data when it can, but it can operate for, for days and uh, even, I think it's fair to say, weeks without being online, okay? Assuming your phone has, has sufficient uh, storage, um, which you know is, is lower if the study doesn't collect uh, too much, etc. Localization Ethica is available. I mentioned in nine languages. What that means is the menus. So remember the menu like a pause data collection or join study. The question is, are those in the appropriate languages? And when I say nine languages are supported, I mean those menus are in that language. By contrast. Um, you can specify, you can type into um, surveys um, text that's in Bengali right now. Ethica isn't supported in its interface yet in Bengali, but the surveys show up in Bengali, and indeed we have a Bengali study um, that is going to be rolling out in Bangladesh. Um, uh, there's some additional logs associated with 
so we know something about how much people are actually logging into Ethica, to what degree they're running the app. We can know something in short about whether adherence reflects a lack of use of the app or did they uninstall the app, that sort of thing. Um, and then some issues with fully customizing the appearance to have a, a really custom app so it looks like, um, it looks like you know, your own app. What I'm going to do now in the closing minutes here is I'm just going to show you a brief uh, uh, introduction to uh, this visualization interface, which is extremely powerful. And uh, it's something which, um, uh, which uh, is, a, um, is a very uh, a study custom um, specific option that adds a lot of value. So I'm going to go down here to what's called Kibana. Okay? Now, um, Kibana uh, is the system that is accessing Ethica data, but it's, it's kind of accessed through that Kibana area on the site. And um, it supports a variety of different uh, mechanisms. One of the most important is uh, to select a workspace. And if you go here to our workspace, you're going to want to choose a workspace that's specific to your study. Now, I actually forgot the study ID number. So I'm going to go back to this, and I'm going to go to the study specifics and study set, uh, settings and um, uh, okay it is study number I should know this uh, 714 thank you sir I much appreciate it 714 or 741 I think it's 714 okay um, <laughs> okay uh, tell you what I will I will just go to the Ethica dashboard just to double check it because it will set us back a little bit if it's in the wrong workspace here. It'll be a bit confusing. So I'm just going to go to Ethica in a different window here and I will go to projects. Oh, there's my McGill one and I'm going to go to design and here we go. 741. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to select 741. That's my workspace. That's going to be the place I can share things with others, etc. So here it's in 741. I can create visualizations that I share with other researchers here. Okay, next. Um, uh, I'm going to actually, in this window, I'm going to go look at my surveys and note their numbers here. The one I'm going to pay attention to is seven or 3731. That's the survey ID number. And I'm going to use that in just a moment, okay? Um, and... Um, I am going to now go to here the um, right. Um, okay, uh, in this workspace, um, I am going to uh, create a um, what's called an, an index here. Okay, um, and this index is going to allow us to um, to visualize uh, the data. Okay, um, so. So study 741 is going to require, uh, require indices, uh, and I'm going to create one here in, in just a second. Okay, So I'm going to go to uh, visualize here, okay? and this visualization will allow me to create an index pattern. So I'm going to say create an index pattern, and basically this allows me for certain types of data to um, to be able to use it in the visualization. So I'm going to use this for ES741 pedometer. Okay, there we go. And uh, I'm going to select that and uh, go to next step here. And it's going to ask me what thing to use for the time. And I'll say record time, which trust me is the, is the one you want to use here. Um, Okay, so I've indexed pedometer. I'm going to create one more index pattern, which is going to be for surveys. So for this, I'm going to select uh, this guy here, ES741 survey responses. Okay, and I am going to copy this here, paste it down. I'm going to say next step, and here I'm going to use record time. These are actually different. Ethica allows you, this is an important point, Ethica allows you to keep track of how long it took to respond to every question. 
not merely to the survey as a whole, but every question, which is sometimes valuable. Did they dwell on this or did they rush through it? I'm sorry? Uh, in uh, what granularity? Milliseconds? Uh, yes, second. down to milliseconds, I, I, I believe is the, um, the timing. Um, so uh, I'm going to select record time here, um, which is the time for the whole, um, the whole survey as a whole. And I'm going to create an index pattern for this. OK. Um, mindful of the time, um, we're just going to use these two. I could show a lot more than this. But I'm going to go over here, and um, I'm going to go to visualization. Okay, And I'm going to quickly create a couple visualizations. Okay, One thing that's very basic is I'm going to create a uh, what's called a tag cloud. Okay, That's down here. And I'm going to do so from the survey responses, um, the survey responses um, one. And here, I am going to go um, to uh, go and select uh, it's this survey three seven three one. So I'm going to add a filter to only show ones from survey ID. So this is going to be survey ID three is. 3731. I only want to see ones not from, from the baseline, for example. And then um, I am going to go and uh, uh, in this buckets area, click on tags. I'm going to select terms and I'm going to select the answer content here. Okay. And um, uh, the answer content is going to uh, basically be providing me with, uh, with uh, text uh, here. And I'm going to do so not only in the last, uh, the last five minutes, but for the entirety of this year. OK, so these are things that people filled out. Um, you notice wearing long sleeves was a key one. But you have this sort of odd no. Anyone want to guess why is that no in there? Well, it turns out we're getting answers to two different questions. One is to the question Q1, what personal protective behavior were you uh, engaged in? The other is, can you take a photo of this? So I need to add another filter. I'm going to filter by question number. So this is called QID. And we, we want to use question number one alone. Okay, um, And here we go. So this is a tag cloud shown from, um, from so this is tag cloud uh, um, for a found tick survey. Okay. Um, the only final uh, one here, time is, is a fleeting, so I'll just do one more. I'm going to add in uh, one more uh, survey response. This is going to be a pie chart. Okay. Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry. It's going to be a, uh, yes, sure, it'll be a pie chart. Um, it's going to be on survey responses. Uh, and I'm going to, sp to uh, split slices according to the uh, terms here. And I I'm going to select the field here, answer count uh, raw. And I am going to limit this to, once again, study ID is 3731. And I'm going to do so only for, uh, for question number two. Okay, so QID is question is, uh, is two. Oh, oh, did I? Oh, man, I, I, I knocked myself out of it. Oh, no, 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 here we go. Phew. Okay, um, there we go. Okay. So um, having, having done this, um, what I would have expected, OK, so one of my, no, of course. Uh, no, no, the time is set uh, correctly. OK, split by size, aggregation by terms. And here we go. I'm going to delete this guy in case that's, uh, that changes the results. Um, but alas, ah, OK. So that's getting closer. I, maybe I have the uh, 3731. Did I, did I write that wrong? Maybe I said study ID instead of survey ID. I bet I did that. 3731, here we go. 
Okay, um, and I am going to then do further. QID is one, here we go, is one, oh sorry, two. This is the second question, there we go. And of the people who are asked, most majority said no, so that was eight responses, and four indicated that they were willing to share a photo of the tick, the offending tick, okay? Um, so this is a pie chart of uh, photo compliance. There we go. Um, had I time now, um, I would show you several additional visualizations, but I think it's more important to use my um, just you know one or two remarks here that this um, mechanism of using Kibana at a big picture level it allows you to connect to Ethica data for a wide variety of visualizations. Um, the set of visualizations is quite, quite large. If we add them here, we can create heat maps, for example, over geography or area charts or line charts, uh, uh, vertical bars, um, maps, uh, etc. And it allows you to then draw on data from Ethica studies to populate those and to show to show custom visualizations for your study, which means something to you, because they might use features of the particular survey that you're asking or the particular data sources that you're collecting. But the real power of this is only fully realized once you, once you realize that you can share these visualizations. So these visualizations, whether it's the tag count, uh, pie graphs, or many others, can be shared with other researchers through links, and they can be shared in ways that are static, that is, they will see exactly that image, or it can be shared in ways that are constantly updating as new data comes in. And this provides a way, moreover, of building dashboards that can themselves be shared, which include many of these visualizations at once. So we can add in some of these visualizations to this dashboard in a fashion that then um, supports, uh, supports having many different, um, uh, different specific items within a same dashboard. So within the dashboard, uh, I can add just one, or I can in fact add several such uh, visualizations, which can then be displayed on an ongoing basis as data comes in, shared with others, and um, used to sort of monitor study progress in terms that you care about. It can also be used to prepare reports that summarize current study progress to stakeholders who might not be part of the team using this website, but might be interested in and high-level summaries of how the study is going or some of the salient findings of the study. So in short, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I have walked you through the Ethica um, system from its um, uh, researcher perspective, accessing these researcher dashboards, um, setting up a survey in terms of data sources, surveys. We took a very brief look at, at extensions, although I didn't demonstrate them. And then we saw how participants could interface with this through Android, through iOS, and within a couple months time, through a fulsome web-based interface that tries to capture as much of the Ethica experience as possible through any sort of browser, on phone or other mechanism, or, or on a desktop or laptop, et cetera. And a given individual can go back and forth. As studies are updated, the users see them. Um, as they respond, that data goes back where researchers can see it. This provides an environment where you can monitor the study progress. If required, you can add new study instruments or throttle back or more um, the, uh, the existing study instruments um, based on the participant burden, based on what you're learning. In short, all these study details that we set up originally can then be modified during the study as, as needs arise or as uh, burdens uh, become apparent. Um, by monitoring the dashboard on an ongoing basis, you can get an understanding of, of um, study progress, both in 
uh, standardized terms uh, through standard reporting interfaces, but also through these Kibana-based interfaces, which can be very customized to the, to the metrics, the outcomes of interest for that study. Studies like this can enroll individuals on an ongoing basis or follow a cohort for a period of time. All of this data is longitudinal on an individual, following them over time with all the different data from surveys, from different sensor types, from wearables, all tied in with those user records, providing a picture of that individual's story as it evolves across many, uh, many different um, types of measurements. Um, this is the Ethica system. And that it can be achieved without programming is one of the, um, yeah. uh, the, the more favorable achievements of uh, my contributions, I feel, within the public health sphere. But it's also a platform which is advancing very rapidly right now in the psychometric testing area, in the area of supporting extensions and customizations that are much richer yet, in the area of supporting um, very rapid evolution to incorporate study custom functionality well beyond what we have now. So this is uh, a bit of a glimpse uh, of it as a young man, as it were, but it's going to be maturing a lot in uh, coming months and years to become an even more powerful overall platform yet. I'm pleased to have been able to introduce this uh, to you today. Um, I'd like to just finally note that uh, we are running a boot camp in this next month which is not just a boot camp, but an incubator as well. Okay. Meaning that participants go away with a basic design for their study, um, can try it out, can set up visualizations with the guidance of 10 helpful TAs, um, and uh, can work with us uh, learning from best practices of other studies as to what's most likely to work, can adapt existing survey instruments that we have for, for your study, or request extensions from the developers uh, who will be co-teaching it with me. Um, so if anyone are, is interested, I'd be glad to provide specifics. Um, we also have a boot camp in combining these methods with system science techniques, simulation modeling uh, this coming August. So it's been my great pleasure, privilege, and honor to be with you today. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome any uh, questions that I could answer before I have to hit the road to the airport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? You seem to have one. Uh, fine. <laughs> uh, it's fine. I'll talk later. Okay. Uh, you are. You seem to have one in Montreal uh, over there. You have some studies already in Montreal. I'm sorry. You have studies already in Montreal using Ethica. Uh, okay. We, uh, to my knowledge, we. There was a study. If I'm trying to remember. There may be a study with Concordia University that okay. Mohammed is, um, has been conducting. So to be clear here, uh, I mentioned that um, collectively Ethica and IEPI, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the project that gave rise to it, the program that gave rise, have been used for well over 100 studies. I think it's 110, yeah. 120. Ethica for about 80, 87, 90 now maybe. Um, I've, I've been involved with a large fraction, but not most of those okay. studies. Okay. And there is a study, I think, that may have been conducted with Concordia yeah. University. There's also a variety of others across Canada and across North America, Europe, and, and Australia, particularly. Um, uh, I'm not positive if it was situated in Montreal or if you know, the study population was elsewhere. Uh, Sheng Fei here, uh, Sheng Fei Meng, a professor um, here uh, in the health sciences, is, is interested <laughs> in applications um, uh, for for a long-standing Montreal cohort, um, uh, and and she may be the first uh, adopter out of uh, McGill, which we're really excited about and, and honored to, to partner with them. Yeah, so we can talk after. Uh, and my other question is that because uh, you are operating in the context of lifestyle and well-being mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. uh, are you uh, are you planning to integrate in some way? Uh, are you setting up the ecosystem that uh, having different studies in different countries and different types of participants, participant, you have the capacity to really create a body of knowledge that go beyond single study. Yeah. Are you looking into this? Are you already there? Um, this is a very good question. The answer is yes, 
um, to the degree that the that the investigators for the different studies um, are willing to play nicely together <laughs> or or to you know share data with each other. So we do have some studies um, in different countries which are based on similar models, similar designs, and that learn from each other. And those studies interest me a great deal for the reasons yeah. that you're articulating. Um, and we also have a large number of studies that make use of um, custom survey, uh, excuse me, standardized survey instruments mm -hmm. that, you know, PHQ-9, for example, um, or, or that make, make use of certain measures of health system performance or what have you that are common across sites. Mm -hmm. and, and there also, there's a lot of opportunity for cross comparison. Where I think you're pointing the Lorette is, as usual for you, a more strategic level of, of understanding of, of um, um, incentivizing or trying to promote a community of practice that draws on evidence consciously that pools multiple lines, much as a, a meta-analysis or, or a systematic review could draw on, on um, much power from um, moving beyond uh, studies in isolation to combining. I think there's a lot of opportunities for this with Ethica. I'll tell you another th that we haven't yet fully yeah. realized. I'll tell you another thing is certain machine learning tools or analysis yeah. tools we can use from one study and transport them to another and to another, which affords not only an economy of scale, but it also affords a regularity of, of, um, of, of outcome metrics and so on between studies. Yeah, a couple of comments is if you remember when you and I were in contact at NIH, which Indeed. is, I'm talking 2007. We or were eight. younger people too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the time, that was what NIH had started to try to create with right. this uh, childhood obesity that doesn't exist anymore. Right. But that, uh, but more and more, NIH has evolved uh, toward not only making open access data right. as a requirement, right. but also, for instance, in along this line of understanding behavior in context and so on. Uh, now, uh, uh, Leslie Fellow, one of my uh, neuroscience colleagues here, um, is on the scientific board for, uh, they have been having a, work, uh, a working group mm. for identifying a set of tools uh, informing on either or both, I think, uh, the, neuro, uh, the neuro behavioral aspects mm. as mm. well as the environment that is to be administered with all of the RCT that relates to diabetes and uh -huh. obesity. Uh -huh. So that is why uh, what I see, the work that yeah. you have done there over all those years, I think it would be important to have this in mind in terms of uh, building a body of knowledge that we can start looking at complexity, diversity, yeah. and so on. So that's one uh, comment. But the second one also, in terms of example, if you look at uh, uh, the, um, uh, I don't know if it's Harvard or which, uh, uh, which university has been uh, administering the implicit association task. Mm -hmm. It's a website where you all study, you can go and do things there, mm -hmm. and the data are available. So my colleague Mark Baldwin here, mm -hmm. who is interested in applying mm -hmm. machine learning and all the AI to uh, looking at yesterday's uh, social cognition, social reinforcement, and so on. Mm. So he's drawing his sample from there to mm. do this mm. further understanding of what works, when, in what context, right. or whom, and so on. Right. So I think that it uh, it's uh, uh, it could be good to have this in mind. I, I, I'm grateful for that, uh, for both those comments. I'm grateful for that last reference. I'll have to look that up because I'm not familiar with that uh, resource. With respect to the first of them, one of the, the, the plans that I have in the medium term with Ethica is to see if we could build up a systematic library of standardized instruments yeah. and reusable yeah. surveys. I will tell you, You'll remember how uh, those those folks will remember um, when I dragged in those data items to create those surveys. All of those surveys can simply be saved away as what's called a, a JSON file. And that JSON file can then be transported for use in other 
other uh, studies or adapted for use very easily through editing. It doesn't, you know, the drag and drop interface is a very nice one, but sometimes for reusability, we want to be able to specify surveys almost as modules. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, and, uh, and that is supported by Ethica's design here. And one of the things I'd love to do is to work towards standardizing a set of surveys that can then be reused by researchers um, in, in ways that allow for greater comparability. Um, and, and to do so in a way that um, uh, imposes less participant burden than, than issuing them in paper, but, but draws on um, you know, standardized instruments for comparability. Oh, absolutely. And then I, I don't know if you have followed them uh, closely, but they have evolved a lot uh, mm. uh, in terms of developing such a tool uh, that are, uh, mm. uh, and they have, as a founder, they are kind of make it, uh, now they may uh, require that all the data are made available. Right. So that's, right. Uh, uh, and, and I spoke with Sean Fay about the, um, the, the the large and uh, varied sets of psychometric tests, um, but the, the presence in different codomains, co different subdomains, and how they're standardized instruments in, in different subdomains, which um, could in principle be administered by something like Ethica either directly or through referral to external sites, which which is I think a very very attractive thing. Ethica's window onto external sites or window into um, into little uh, psychometric test instruments is one of these areas that we're, that we're finding is in demand for a lot of studies right now. And it can test reaction times and perceptions, etc., in a very flexible way in situ for individuals. And really, so much of this work is about going back to those who were here for the class before, um, going back to you know context, mechanism, and outcome. Um, or, uh, the context, capturing that context as it's fresh with those triggered, contextually triggered surveys by location or by who you're with or by aspects of your, your, your recent history, and asking those questions which can elicit understanding of what's going on on, on different um, cause generative pathways hypothesized to, to understand, and then as a way of recording outcomes, whether it's symptomology or, or, or aspects of, of um, uh, cognitive function or aspects of, um, of uh, exacerbations or physiological things that you picked up on wearables. So there's big options here to inform many aspects of what we, we study in critical realist perspective and what's captured in models. Yeah, so that is why for, uh, for us, I think uh, one immediate next step will be as we put the CFI together, we will see to what extent, for instance, we are building various synthetic ecosystems of mm -hmm. Montreal and so on and so forth, and what you have in Saskatchewan is also very, so we will, uh, we will see within the context of, uh, of, of building research capacity for, for this uh, infra digital architecture. But uh, I think in terms of study, uh, that is uh, um, uh, knowing now where you are, I think we, uh, we will definitely not reinvent any wheel. <laughs> so which, uh, which cohort are you working on? So uh, this is a longitudinal cohort established from 2006. And we have What's the name of the cohort? Uh, Mont uh, Montreal Southwest Mental oh. Health Survey. Okay. Uh, we actually based our justice. I just talked with uh, Nick over okay. the over the break. Okay. So you work with the doctor Yumi as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the cohort that we established twelve years ago. And initially the pioneer was Dr. John Karan and he retired and then I'm the, the next leader for this cohort. And it's the aging adults, it's a clinical cohort? Uh, this is a population community based cohort. And we have a, a population age from 50 to 70 class. And then right now we're on the sixth data collection and trying to introduce the next generation of the our oh, okay. cohort. And we're interested in using uh, Adeka to uh, do the data collection inside of doing face-to-face mm -hmm. -face interview mm -hmm. for all 
the modules that we already kind of over the past 10 years. Any further questions? So we, we should be for doing And uh, yeah. I would note that Sean Fei's history with me goes back. Sean Fei is one of the few people around who remembers me talking about IFP Ethica yes. um, just as it was getting started. <laughs> and she can vouch, Lorette, <laughs> of my, um, uh, of, of, I would talk about it in the context of obesity and the possibility of trying to track social yeah. Yeah. influences yeah. on behavior. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, that's, 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 really, that, that's really good that you took the time to come in class and also to, to reconnect uh, more in depth because I think there's a lot of synergy. Yeah. Well, grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you I'd be so glad much. to answer, uh, answer questions um, as I prepare to uh, catch a cab, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I think you should. I thought you were, your plane is at 5.30, so you do need to. Uh, yeah.